This is an SBC Media Partners production. Swung on, hit high and deep. Right field. Right field. Right field. Right field. It is Phillies fans, these are your glove stories with Murph. Let's check in with Greg Murphy. Murph, you got a special guest, huh? Hi, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Glove Stories with Murph, brought to you by the Parks Casino Sportsbook app. And it is a real pleasure to welcome in our guest today on 11 years in the big leagues for this guy and uh, certainly very memorable moments of his time in Philadelphia, which we're going to get into as well. And a guy that, well, you can see around the ballpark nowadays as well, still with the Phillies organization. It's a real pleasure to welcome in Vicky Knowles, who is our guest Thanks, today. Murph, Vicky, good, good to see to you. Here. Yeah. Uh, you know, we're, we're lucky enough to get to see you and talk with you um, from time to time, being in and around the ballpark and and the organization. But folks, um, you know, folks away from the game probably don't have that opportunity. So it's great to, to have you here today. And I'm looking forward to hearing uh, hearing some of your, your glove stories as we uh, work our way through your career. Now, you were a guy who was drafted uh, right out of high school in the fourth round uh, coming out of North Carolina. Uh, 18 years old and headed to professional baseball. You know, I, I always, um, I marvel at how quickly baseball players, young men like yourself have to grow up uh, when, when, when you leave home and, and now all of a sudden you're, you're playing professional baseball. You've got a job at age 18. Um, how was that transition for you? Well, it was, it was great for me because all I ever want to do is be a major league baseball player ever since I fell in love with the game of baseball and then when I signed with the Phillies, I remember I was in the high school state championship and uh, Philly signed me. And I was kind of in the back of my mind thinking, am I going to Philadelphia? <laughs> and then when the guy said, no, you're be going to Auburn, New York. I went, kind of figured that. Where's Auburn, <laughs> New York at? Never heard of Auburn, New York. And I love playing in the NYP league. So I went up to Auburn, New York, joined the club with all the other players, people from uh, Puerto Rico, people from Dominican, people from Texas, people from California. So we all are one team, all thinking that each one of us, uh, you know, we're all thinking we're the best players we ever seen. Then right. when we got there, we're thinking we're the worst player there. Everybody else is better than us. So that was a, that was interesting because I'm the first day I threw on the side, I believe Dallas Green was there and I was throwing beside a guy by the name of Sammy Welburn, who was the number one draft pick and he's throwing hundred miles an hour. Wow. And I had never seen anyone throw harder than me in high school. So I'm looking at this guy like, Am I good enough? Look at this guy throw the baseball. It's amazing. But I enjoyed that experience. Yeah. It, you know, it's amazing to, to, because it always seems to be the same thing for no matter who I've, I've talked to on this podcast. Um, when you arrive in rookie ball, when you arrive in the minor leagues, the first thing that seems to go through all of your heads is, am I good enough? You're looking yeah. around and you're looking at everybody else. I mean, even Mike Schmidt said the same thing when I was talking to him, am I good enough to play at the big league level? Um, how quickly do you, you know, kind of get that confidence back that I'm sure you had out on the mound in high school, you had to have uh, being the kind of player that you were, how quickly does that come back or does it take some time? Uh, I think it comes pretty quick as soon as you start playing together because then you realize it doesn't matter what size, what shape you are. It's the ability that God's given you. So when you go out, I made my first start. I walked out on the field and 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 I and I no longer was, you know, looking at around at the big people like, you know, I felt like I was small compared to everyone else. I was six foot two, but I was like 158 pounds. And I felt like everybody else looked like a man and I looked like a little boy out there. But when I got on the mound and started competing, then then everything kind of meshed together. And then you realize you are you can compete. You are good enough. And so, you know, it's a transition from from life to professional baseball. There's no doubt. I think the kids today kind of go through a little different transition. I think we were lucky. I really believe that because all we want to do is play baseball. So we came to the ballpark. We were there earlier. And I think we got more work back in those days. So we would go out on the field you know, you'd, you'd be, at, you'd probably get to the ballpark around one o'clock and then you're already on the field after lunch playing and practicing and things like that. And you didn't have as much downtime. I felt like that. At least I feel like that. So that's what we want to do is play baseball. So, and then, you know, you're hanging around with a bunch of 18 and 19 year olds after the game and you're going home, you're going to bed, you're getting up and you're doing it again. Yeah. So it, yeah and it really sounds good. like a, a, yeah, if you love baseball and you love what you're doing, that certainly is a, is a great lifestyle at that point. Uh, you mentioned, you know, folks, not only from all over the country, but you know, from all over the world in essence, right. you know, certainly uh, 
from uh, down in the Dominican and, and the, in Puerto Rico, as you mentioned. Um, was it a culture shock for a young guy coming out of North Carolina to uh, all of a sudden be, you know, uh, in and around uh, all those different cultures? Not for me, it wasn't, but it is for a lot of guys that I deal with now. And I'll tell you why, because, you know, uh, once you get on a ball field, you're a teammate. And like I said, that's all I want to do is become a major league baseball player. So this was going to be a stepping stone for me to become a major league baseball player, a, 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 an, air, an area of my life where I was going to learn in rookie ball and hopefully move up the next year. I started to understand that. The, the, the tough thing was understanding you had to pay bills now on your own <laughs> or you, you had to be accountable for your life uh, away from home. Uh, and yeah, people get homesick and things like that. Um, we didn't have cell phones back then. So I'd always go to the pay phone and you'd stand in line to go call your mom or dad, you know, at the pay phone and your girlfriend. Um, <laughs> so that was a, that was tough, you know, and, but there's girls on the road too in other areas. So I'm sure that many players kind of experienced what I experienced was, okay, now you get away from home and you kind of, uh, I'd already let my hair down uh, my senior season. So most people think I was crazy my, most of my life, but my senior season, I started to, to, to party, if you will, and yep. started to run into things that were going to um, disable me later on in life. But uh, at that time, I, uh, you know, getting away uh, from home and starting to learn how to how to do a lot of different things, such as pay bills, such as be responsible and accountable and, and um, also experience new things. Yeah. You know, it's funny when you, you think about that. And I have kids that are in college age now, one in high school and college age. And, you know, when they when folk, kids go off to college. They get part of that experience. They get the uh, the freedom of being on their own and, and starting to be able to do and uh, what they want, when they want, at any time they want. Uh, but the responsibility, as you're talking about, about paying bills and that kind of thing, that comes even later for for kids that are going off to college. But for ball right. players, you know, that's the way it was. And it's not like you were making a whole lot of money at the time. So you have to you have to seriously think about <laughs> where you're spending your money and and how you're spending your money. It's it you do you grow quickly, do you not? 500 bucks a month, <laughs> a month. <laughs> you know, but we're, you know, we're living together with other guys. There's, I think I had four, four roommates. Uh, there was five of us, my first place in Auburn, of course. Uh, it seemed to be my home where everybody kind of went to hang out. So we kind of got kicked out of that and split up. With, and then I was with three other guys, but it was, it was, it was uh, to me, if you want to play baseball, and you're coming out of high school or college, the perfect place to go is the NYP League. I mean, we were able to go to Hall of Fame. We went to uh, to Niagara Falls. Niagara Falls was a team in the league. And who wouldn't want to go to the, to the Hall of Fame and and, and play so, when we're playing in Oneano? So our whole club would go to the Hall of Fame. And then we went to uh, Niagara Falls to play. So to me, it was kind of like a uh, – uh, I, I, didn't, I didn't think about going to college, but it was almost like a vacation. Yeah. A vacation playing the game you love. Yeah. You know, I, I wonder as we sit here and tape this, the uh, Major League Baseball draft has just ended. Um, you'll get a chance to to meet our young guys as they come into the organization in the next couple of weeks. I wonder as you sit and watch and, and see some of these kids getting drafted, does it bring you back to that time in your life when uh, when you were just getting started? And if so, are, are those memories, they certainly sound like they're fond memories for you, are they? They're great memories, Murph. You know what I did when I went up to, I used to do trainings for our ball club. When we had draft players, some of them would go to Florida. Some of them would go to NYP league up in uh, Williamsport. Mm -hmm. So what I would do every year was I could not wait. There's a, there's a holiday in in Auburn where I played at 18 years of age with the Phillies. And so I would wait till the club went there and I'd go do my leadership, go over to policy sort of thing, training for the new players. And there's a nice little room in the Holiday Inn. And then I would walk around and walk to the ballpark and walk around where I used to live. So, yeah, it, it was reminiscing about times when you – the most important time for a Major League Baseball player is when he signs his first contract, which is a minor league contract mm -hmm. most of the time. And when you sign that professional contract, the next most important thing is when you get to the big leagues because everybody at home is going to finally ask you, when are you going to make it? When are you going to make it? When are you going to become a pro? I'm already a pro. Then you get to the big leagues and I walked into Veterans Stadium and, you know, back then I seen some pretty good players. First guy I seen yeah. when I walked in the clubhouse was Pete Rose and of course, Larry Boa, they were in there chatting, 
you know, how they are. Larry Boa and, and Pete Rose, you're not going to out-talk either one of those guys. And you're not going to outwit either one of those guys. So those are the first two players that I walk in and seen the day out. I, I'd never, I, I mean, I'd never even been in a big league ballpark other than I went to a, a high school. I went to see the Atlanta Braves play the Cincinnati Reds. And that was the only game I'd ever witnessed in person. And now awesome. I'm in the big league clubhouse and I'm pitching. And then I see Mike Smith. And then I'm looking over seeing Tug McGraw, who I grew up loving, and Steve Carlton. And I had to pinch myself. So that's the second one. And then the next one is to play in the World Series. That all happened pretty fast for me. Yeah, for you it did. And 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 so I, let me back you up a little bit because uh, you, you know you work your way through the minor leagues, and as you're doing that, uh, you know you're you're becoming you know a, a young man as you as you talked about, but you're also becoming a better ball player. Was there a moment in time where you said to yourself? Because, I mean, as we know, not the good percentage of guys that play professional baseball don't ever make it to the big leagues. Was there a time when you said to yourself, okay, I, I think I think there's a chance that I'm going to be in Philadelphia before too long? Okay, this might take me a while to answer this one, but I got to answer it correctly. In 1975, I got drafted, and I, I thought I was going to be in the big leagues in a year or two because I went to Instructional League. It was two months then. We had major league players playing then. And I dominated right out of high school. I was like three and two in Auburn. And I was five and oh in structural league. I dealt. The next year, I couldn't get anybody out. I had a 5.71 ERA. I was four and 16. I don't think I've ever seen a guy have a worse minor league season than I did. But there was a manager we had that came over from Cincinnati, Jim Snyder. God rest his soul. He just passed. And Snyder was a guy that kind of Took this, tried to take the Cincinnati approach to Philadelphia. I mean, we like to wear our socks up like Mike Smith, mm -hmm. get our hair curled like Mike Smith and Larry Boy, you know. And Phillies had the best uniforms back then. They were the coolest team. And uh, he came and cut my stirrups one day and said, you got to learn. To, you, you're not in the major leagues left. You got to learn discipline. You got to learn how to wear a uniform. I, I didn't like him. I gave him the nickname, the general. And, and then uh, we're going to uh, Peninsula. And I'm on the bus ride. And he calls me up. And says, Dickie, come on up here. And I walked up to the front seat and he handed me the baseball. And I looked at him like, I said, what is this? He said, if you don't know what that is, just give it back. <laughs> I knew what it was. He's giving me the opening day start. I just thought he was crazy. Wow. He said, you're starting me opening day. So I started opening day and I became the starting all-star pitcher for that team that year. And it was a guy in our organization by the name of Granny Hamner. And Granny was a great baseball player. He was a rover. And I pitched a game against Lynchburg one night. And I heard him telling Jim Snyder, said, that guy can pitch in the big leagues right now. And, and I remember hearing that. And that was the day that I walked out of there. Snyder was always motivating me to tell me that I had the best arm in the organization, that I, I just had the worst head. And he said, you need to grow from here up and <laughs> learn how to pitch and quit throwing. As a matter of fact, Jim Snyder came over to me spring training one day and everybody was watching and raving because I was throwing the ball hard and popping the ball. You know, I had a bad year at Spartanburg. And that's all everybody was saying was, look at that arm. Look at that arm. Snyder came over and he walked over to me and he goes, you're throwing hard. And I looked at him and I was like, OK, that's pretty good. That's the manager I want to play for. And then he walked away. I said, I impressed him. Then he turned around and walked back and said, just think how good you could be if you could throw strikes. <laughs> so he kind of hit me right between the eyes again. And that's what Snyder did for me. And uh, that year, I knew that year, 1977, after my worst year in professional ball, which was my first full season, the next year I knew I, I seen Neil Allen, Jeff Reardon, we were all on the all-star team together and I was a starting pitcher. So with all that talent in that league, I said, I have a chance to become a major league player. But then again, my career never, you know, I, I went to Reading, I won 12 games the next year in Las mm -hmm. eight, but it wasn't that great. And then I went to Oklahoma City, but John Vukovic, uh, is the guy that kind of told me, he says, you know, if you won't, you can pitch in the big leagues this year. And I was looking at Vuk like, I'm, I've been in AAA for like 20 minutes and you're telling me that? Mm -hmm. I haven't even started a game at AAA yet. And Vuk was instrumental in my career. He was a third baseman. He's the reason why I walked the third to get the ball because I, I was, I, I started year 0 and 4. I tore a, um, I tore the back of my, Achilles a little bit and a fight that we had a famous fight we had a lot of famous fights in under Dallas Green yeah. and uh, so I went there and I, I, I only pitched like eight in as I was like going four and then I, I my legs started to get better and then I won six straight games but he would get the ball and hand it to me and he goes you're good enough to be in the big league show me now that's why I used to go to third to get the ball oh, how about and that? so 
I think different, we have so many different people in our life. And with the Phillies, we were very fortunate. Larry Rojas, Bob Tiefenhauer, all those guys were molding us to become Philadelphia Philly players. Yeah. You know, it's amazing how many times John Vukovic's name comes up when we are talking uh, on this podcast and talking to guys that have come through the organization, the impact that he had, not only as a teammate, but then as a, you know, later as a coach um, on so many people in this organization, um, we all, you know, obviously lost him way too soon, but uh, the fact that his legacy lives on in this organization through, through you guys is, is so impressive. It's, I, I love hearing the stories cause he could be, he could be tough. <laughs> I mean, he, he, he didn't sugarcoat tough. things, right. But, but no one but, knew the real John Vukovic unless you play. Yeah. Because we were having John Vukovic stories on a golf tournament yesterday, Tommy Green and Mickey Morandini, we were sitting there telling John Vukovic right. stories because we always get that question. Why are players feel so entitled today? And why are they so soft today? And, and uh, Mickey said, and Tommy echoed it because they didn't play under Vuk. <laughs> <If> Vuk <laughs> would have been on that club. They wouldn't be that way. But he was truthful. Yeah. But Vuk was one of the greatest teachers. We're going to honor a guy this year who was a tremendous teacher in a different way as Manny Trio. Uh, you know, I played with Trio later in my career and, and Manny was a great teacher too. These guys were good teachers because it was taught to them. That's what we're missing in the game today. We don't have personal coaching like we used to. And by that, I mean, we don't have the kind of full coaching. I don't know if that's the right word. We don't have the total complete coaching that we used to have, which would tell you the truth and tell you when you're not doing things right. You know, we have a commissioner, and I probably shouldn't say this, but doesn't want the game played the way it used to be played. Right. I think the way it used to be played taught you how to live in life as well as live on the baseball field. And I think that's the real way to learn to play the game. There is a right way to play the game. I hate hearing old school and new school. I like the word right school. Yeah, I, I, I am with you 100%. And I think that's a great way of putting it. And the word that pops into my mind when I'm hearing you, you speak right now is accountability. And it's not just in baseball, it's it's everywhere. You know, we see this everywhere, uh, this lack of accountability. For whatever reason, um, we're afraid to to hold people to a higher standard nowadays. And I and agree. we shouldn't be, but but it, it's crept into our sports and it's it's certainly crept into our society. Uh, I'm, I'm hopeful that it comes back. But you're right, guys like John Vukovic, guys like Dallas Green, guys like Paul Owens, the men who were influential in your career, they were the ones that, uh, well, they were some of the ones that, that held people accountable back then. And, uh, and I'm sure you're very thankful for that because Amen. things would be different had they not held you accountable for a lot of things, right? I'd be dead, probably. Most people think so. I think Dallas Green probably saved my life. And people, I've had people to question me on that. When I spoke at his funeral, um, I forget who it was. I know who it was. Just no sense. Sam says, how can you say Dallas Green saved your life? Well, I, I really feel like that if he wouldn't have intervened in my life and he wouldn't have came in to my life when he did, uh, sometimes I think I wouldn't have been in the big leagues at all without Dallas Green. If you look at Dallas Green signed me, Dallas Green um, brought me to the big leagues and, and he traded for me, then he traded me and he traded me for myself. Now, how about yes, that? But, I know. <laughs> um, you know, I, he was very involved in my life off the field. Uh, I remember running one day in the outfield uh, he would, he had punished me and I'm running in the outfield and he, 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 he thought he was going to break me, but he couldn't, nobody could run as much as me. I, I could not, I mean, I'm telling you, I would not work out in the winter and I could come to spring training and outrun everybody. I, I just could run. And he's out there watching me and I'm running, laughing, like, you know, Hey, this is better than setting out shagging. I'll run all day long. Most people right. don't like it, but I'm running. And then he got me really good. Uh, at the end of the evening, I was running with our uh, 20 sprints that we, well, it's 20 liners that we do as a pitcher. And Kevin Sauche, who could not walk and chew bubblegum half the time, was my running partner. And he hollered at me, and he was older than me. He was a veteran a little bit. He said, you're embarrassing me. Quit running so hard. So I did, because it's, you know, other pitchers. And Dallas got on the, that roof, and he hollered at me, Nolsey, if you don't start running like I know you can, you're going to be here until midnight tomorrow night. And I believed him. So I, I ran, took off and left Saucier. But Dallas was a type of guy that uh, I loved him. I, I People ask me, do I love him like a father? No, I loved him like a great friend because I'm old now. I, I grew 
uh, closer to him as time went on. But when he was uh, in my life, as a, a, he always told me this privately. He always said that he didn't care if I became a major league player. He said, I wanted you to be a major league player because I drafted you not seeing the talent. What I cared about was I wanted to make sure that you were going to be able to survive in life. If, if you didn't make it here with the Phillies, and that was our philosophy back then. You just mentioned them, Paul Owens, Dallas Green. They moved Sandberg to Chicago, and he became a Hall of Fame player, and he was one of their favorite players. They wanted you to be successful, but they wanted you to be successful if you wasn't a good baseball player and didn't make it in baseball. When you left the Phillies, they wanted you to be successful in life, too. Yeah, because, yeah, it was more it was more than just about the game. I mean, the game was the catalyst for for the relationship. But uh, but for those guys, yeah, the, the importance was was the full person, uh, which which is awesome. And, and I think there's still people in our organization and around baseball today that that feel that way and are and then yes. look after players in that regard. Um, it's important. That, that's that's what needs to be done. Let me let me take you back because you brought it up and it was a question I was going to ask you specifically. You were a very young player, a young major league player, not a rookie, but in your second year in 1980 in a clubhouse, as you mentioned, looking around with a uh, hall of famers to your right, to your left, uh, the game of baseball back then there was a place for young players and there was a place for guys that had proven it on the big league level. You were probably certainly considered one of the young guys at that time. Was it intimidating? Was it, um, was it, you know, difficult for you to, to kind of work your way in or, or were the players, the veteran guys kind of a little bit uh, more accepting behind closed doors in the clubhouse? Well, there, there was a, there was a philosophy back then that you, that I think Sandberg said it best. You know, he said he learned to come uh, through the Phillies to, to be heard was not the way it should be to be seen and not heard was, was what he learned and to come into the ballpark and do your work and, and, and just listen. And I think that's that's the way it was. I was different, though, because on July the 4th, I got called to the big leagues that night. On July the 5th, I pitched. But I still was I, – I, my first locker was between Bate McBride and Manny uh, Trio. And then my locker, they moved me down with the other pitchers. Uh, but I, I, I got to share this with you. So I said in my locker, I'm pitching that night. And Bate McBride came over and looked at me, and he looked at me. And I'm looking at Bate McBride, and he's looking at me, he goes – he looks at Manny and Manny looks at me and he goes, babe, now we got this guy between us. Can you believe that? It's my first game. And they both kind of talk back and forth. And basically what they said was, you just pitch. Don't say a word. We don't want to hear you. It, we'll let you know when you can talk. And so I lost my first game. I got beat three to two. I went out winning two to one. I only pitched like five innings or something. Then the next game, I beat Vita Blue and I pitched wow. uh, eight and two thirds. And my good friend Warren Brewster came in and got to save because I walked Johnny a master for my ninth walk. Ben Davis always asked me, how many pitches did you throw in that game? Seven punch outs, nine walks. I said, only give up three hits. <laughs> and the only run I gave up by the blue hit a home run. So after that game, I got my win. And I remember coming in the next day and I was still between those two. And I came in and Bake McBride looked at me and says, you still can't talk. <laughs> <laughs> You've only won one. <laughs> so it, it was, it was good to learn that way though. Yeah. But intimidated. No, um, I don't think we were intimidated uh, being young guys. Lonnie Smith is not a guy you're going to intimidate. Keith Morin's not. I remember the Pittsburgh Pirates. We used to fight them all the time. And Bill Madlock, I played with Madlock when I got traded to uh, the uh, Tigers. And he says, Man, where, where did you guys grow up? Lonnie Smith, Keith Moreland, Bob Walk, Marty Bystrom, Ramona Billies, all you guys come up. We used to fight the Phillies. Smitty wasn't going to fight because he, he, we couldn't get, he didn't, he's not that way. You know, Smitty yeah. was a guy that he couldn't understand why you were fighting. Smitty was a great guy and he's your franchise player and nobody's going to mess with him. Nobody was going there, Steve Carlton. So all this fighting out on the field, all of a sudden you young guys come up and we can't get you guys to quit fighting. We play the Phillies. We used to say, we can go in there and intimidate the Phillies. Now we play the Phillies and we're got, got, don't hit nobody on the Phillies telling our pitchers, you know, right. Keeson had hit Smith one year and Manlock said, don't hit those guys. Those crazy young guys they got are nuts. Well, that's because we came up through Dallas. Yeah. Dallas yeah, demanded and was, that we play yeah. to win and play tough and nobody was going to whoop our rear ends. 
Yeah, no one was going to make you look bad. They might, they might beat you from time to time, but no one was going to make you look bad from a baseball right. sense. And, uh, yeah, you, you came up through Dallas Green, and he had a little bit of a philosophy that, hey, you know, you have to protect our guys. And, well, probably one of the most – memorable moments of your career was exactly that. And I have to ask you about it. I know, I know you get asked about it all the time, but in the world series uh, game four, and uh, you're, you're facing George Brett, their fr franchise player, and you come up and in and you knock him on his butt. That was, I, I know it was, I, I've read the stories, you know, uh, over the years about that pitch. And I know it was something that kind of happened spur of the moment for you, but it, it really started back in the minor leagues when you learned how to be a good teammate, did it not? Yes, it did. And and that's why I think in 1980 that the young players, but Rose was like that too. Dallas protected us. When he would go in there and lay the law down and have a screaming match, he always took care of young players. He never, he, he never singled us out. And Rose took care of young players too. That pitch to Brett, thank God I didn't hit him because I'd be, I don't know if you've ever read the book Calico Joe. But no. it's a good one. You ought to read it. I okay. think I didn't wrote it. I'm drawing a blank on his name, but wrote Smith's uh, bio bio biography. But it's a it's a story of a. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you later. But it's a good book. But it's okay. an old alcoholic pitcher for the Mets. Beans this guy Calico Joe, and his career is over. And I I could have ended George Brett's career. And yeah. the thing that got me the next day when I woke up, thank God I didn't hit him. Um, the pitch was. The you know I've lied about the pitch for forty years, so I don't know if I'm going to be truthful about it or not. Because sometimes I've lied so much about it because I didn't want to talk about it in the very beginning. Yeah. So I would tell different stories, so the writers would go back and go, "He told me this, told me that. Leave that pitch alone. And don't ask him nothing." But then I unintentionally lied about the circumstances because I thought I came in the 1980 World Series with the bases loaded, and I didn't. I came in and loaded the bases for Christian. <laughs> so I got confused myself, but. The reality of that pitch was, embarrassingly, I can honestly say now, because I've talked to Brett, is I did throw it at his head. But in, back in those days when we want to knock a guy down, I was one of the pitchers that would fire it at a guy's head. The first time I hit a guy in the head, it changed me forever, though. I never wanted to throw up there again. And I, when I first uh, came in to work for the Phillies as an EAP, I wasn't always an EAP. I was a guy that would talk to the minor leaguers about the effects of drugs and alcohol and pitch it inside. And I always tell our guys, don't throw up there. There's no need to throw up there because if you hit somebody like I did there, uh, it's going to stay with you and it doesn't go away. But when I threw it, Brett, I knew I was going to knock him down because I'd done it many times, but I wanted to hit Willie Mays Akins because yeah. he hit the two home runs and he was standing at home plate. And if you go back and watch that game, they were doing some things which someone needed to come inside. And at this pitch wasn't just Dickie Knowles. When I went back to the dugout, I wanted to pitch. I had like five straight strikeouts, six strikeouts. I wanted to get 10 strikeouts. I never had 10 strikeouts in a game. And I said to Dallas, if you leave me in this game, I'm going to get 10 strikeouts. He looked at me like, what are you talking about? <laughs> you know, I might need you later on. I go, why are you taking me out? Leave me in this game. And uh, I had no idea the pitch was going to be viewed that way. But when that inning started, I wasn't going to do anything to Brett, but I threw a fastball by him and another one by him. And he was kind of not getting in the box. And I was not real happy because I, I, you know, we wanted to win and there were some things going on. So I remember kind of looking at him like, Hey, you better get in the box. I might knock you down. And so I made up my mind to knock him down. Why not? And uh, when I threw the pitch, he got out of the way and hit the ground. It kind of happened so fast. The fans were booing. Then they first, they didn't say nothing. They were silent. Then they started booing. Fry ran out. And I think the, I had the greatest view in the, in the whole building. I mean, I'm sitting there listening to Pete Rose talk to Jim Fry, and it was hilarious. And yeah. Rose made the pitch. In my opinion, he made the pitch because when he went in and challenged Fry, and you, of course, you know the whole story, he's not throwing at him. And Fry goes, how do you know? He goes, if he's throwing at him, he'd hit him. And then he, you know, he looks at their dugout and so tells me, you can hit any of those guys in there if you want to, too. I think what Rose did was say, we threw the pitch. Yes. Not Dickie. Yes. You guys want to play the game that way and slide in on our runner, our our fielders, and and high five each other and act like that we're not even here. And I, I don't know if that pitch did anything to the World Series. I really don't believe it because Bystrom threw a heck of a game and you had Carlton in Game Six yep. and you know 
when you pitch and wins. So, but I'm honored that the fact that it's still remembered because nobody would have ever known I played for it. So. <laughs> well, you know, I, I, and I think you're, you're being a little humble in that, you know, the game of baseball is, it's a game of, of it's very, it's very mellow and quiet for a while. And then if something happens, then boom, you know, things can change in a heartbeat. Emotions can change. Momentum can change. And sometimes it is something like w what happened uh, with you and George Brett that can change the momentum. So, you know, whether or not it, it changed the course of the World Series, there are guys, your, your teammates, that believe it did just that. And so, you know what? I'll take them at their word because they're the hey. guys that were behind you hey, on the field. Me. Yeah. I, I like hearing it, you know. <laughs> uh, you, you know, I, I got to share this. I thought I probably shared this before. I was in the dugout and the third inning, I think it was, and Tug was still there. And I walked by. We, we, people asked me, did Dallas Green tell you to do that? No, we, we didn't want to wait for the manager to tell you. We kind of took care of each other. I walked by Tug and Marty Bystrom and Bobby Walk. I walked by Tug and Tug goes, uh, he goes, you might want to move somebody. And I said, I will. And he goes, well, you got to show me. I'm from Missouri. He's kind of telling me it's soon, you know, yeah. you need to do something. Yeah, let's not we wait. We want to win this game. And, and, and so Marty Bystrom walked by me and we call Marty hard Marty. Marty walked by me and he goes, be afraid to knock somebody down. So it wasn't like the, the word wasn't circulating in mm -hmm. our dugout a little bit. And if you go back and watch the game, you probably, you know, you, you see how McCray hit a single stretch it to a double. I think Amos Otis may have done that. They were leaning out over the plate and just hitting balls out of the ballpark and off the wall. So I think my teammates were trying to say, hey, you know, get some of that plate back. I don't think they expected me to do it the way I did it, though. <laughs> well, you got you got the whole plate back. <laughs> and then some. Uh, and then I think some. the next pitch is my favorite pitch. The you know what? Slider. You talk about an uncompetitive swing. You know, and George Brett, one of the great <laughs> players in baseball. That I that know. swing after he got knocked down was about as as a weak a swing as you're going to see from a great player. Um, yeah, I agree. So yeah, so it, it had its effect. Uh, yeah, the, in the words of Larry Anderson, the Royals were tasting themselves a little bit as that uh, series went on, and uh, and you know, with uh, with one pitch, uh, things started to change. Let me uh, let me ask you this. On a side note, I'm just curious to get your thoughts on this. I know you talk about there is no place throwing up a, a, at a player, but do you think in, in today's game there is there is a place for moving guys off the plate? Is there a time when hitting a guy on the backside is warranted? I, I think that? the way the game's played now, the, the way the fans are, I, I don't agree with the, you know, we got to, uh, you know, like let the kids play or whatever the, the terminology is. I, I believe it's not good for the game. I, I think the game was a better game. 1980, I still, somebody gave me a scrapbook for 1980. It's awesome. I look at the time of the games, two hours, 15 minutes, two yeah. hours, 30, one hour, 51, lefty pitch, yeah. one hour, 49, lefty pitch. You know, uh, Ruth of it, two hours and 15 minutes. Uh, Christensen with three relievers. To, you know, I, I look at that. I go, how did we do that? Yeah. Naturally, you didn't have TV as much involved now. But I think one of the things that umpires did we, we've talked to umpires a lot. I, I don't like the cave zone thing. You know what I mean? I just wish they'd do away with that. Let umpires be umpires. And umpires would, come on, let's go. Let's go. Get out on the field. Let's go, guys. You'd rush back and forth. There was a, there was a way to play the game. Mm -hmm. uh, are the games too long? Some of my favorite games of baseball were the Boston Red Sox, New York Yankees, four-hour and 15-minute games when we'd have our organizational meetings down in Florida, and then we'd rush to our room to see the end of the game. Those were different games. It was an exciting game. Home runs, strikeouts, and all this stuff going on now with walks. I never could understand why a walk sometimes can be valued more than a hit. I know if you ask a hitter, hit the ball in the fat part of the back, got a base hit, it feels a lot better from that hit. Sure. But somehow we've gotten to this thing about if I see a lot of pitches, I'm, and, and then we got in this whole thing about 80 pitches, 90 pitches. Take, a, take out a guy with 100 pitches. To me, that's insanity. Yeah. I, 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 there's no proof that these guys are going to get hurt. And I think they'll be better if they threw more pitches. And I, I, I'd like to see the game speed up, more strikes, throw the ball down, pitch up when you have to. And I think the way the hitters are, if you brought back baseball to be played the right way, and I'm going to say it again, I, I, and, you know, Ronald Acuna and, and, and uh, Ozuna in the, and last year stopping in the playoffs to take – 
you know, a photo of himself, selfie coming around third. I got calls on that. And uh, Doug Manzolino and myself were talking about it one night. And he says, would you have hit one of those guys? I said, I'd hit both of them. Because yeah. if I wouldn't, I wouldn't have been able to answer to my teammates. You know, there's right. a place for it. Uh, I think the game's becoming too much I, my, me, me. I hate to say this, but did you see the home run derby last night? I, I watched a little of it. It's not my cup of tea, to be quite honest with you. Mine because, either. Yeah. I, it's I just... came home late. I seen the last round. Uh, I haven't, I, I, and please don't judge me for this, but I've seen every all-star game since I was nine years old. I probably won't watch, I won't watch tonight's all-star game because I'm going to watch the Reading Phillies. That's where I want to go tonight. So I'm heading there. But when I look at the all-star game last night and I see a guy win the all-star game and then kind of go out and, and showboat it and say things like this, I'm the best power hitter in the game. You know, and I know I was going to win. I mean, just say you're happy for winning. And, and I, I just seen Griff, Griffey walk out, and he kind of didn't take the opportunity to recognize one of the greatest players ever in the yeah. history of the baseball. And if baseball was smart this year, they would have recognized one of the greatest players in, in the history of baseball in Atlanta, Hank Aaron. Mm -hmm. You know, baseball should stay out of politics. Hank Aaron just passed. He, the All-Star game could have been Atlanta, and they should have – recognize Hank Aaron's great career that bothered me but uh I, I I think that the way the guys are now if we say anything they look at us like we're old farts and that we're you know old-time baseball players but I can guarantee you one thing we have more fun playing a game than they did with all that stuff that they do I I think you're probably right about that and I and I think you know so many people uh, agree with what you're saying. And and I do think at some point, and maybe we're even beginning to see the beginnings of it, that it's going to creep back a little bit. It may never, it's not going to go back to the game that it was in, in 1980 um, or before that, but certainly, but I, but I do think it can mimic it a little bit closer than, than where we were over the last six, seven, eight years. Um, I and I, I, for one, answer, as a baseball, I, yeah, I think you got the answer, Murph. If it comes in, you know, somewhere in the middle, I think it'd be yeah. a better game. It would be. I, I I believe that, and I think there's there are some young guys that I've heard say that over the past couple of years that I think believe that as well. And uh, we just need more of those guys to to get into the into the league and and respect the game for what it is and, and understand the history of the game and appreciate the the history of the game. The game's been around a long time, been pretty successful. Yes, they must have been doing something right for for a little while. And I think remember it's remember Bryce Harper's home run against the Cubs. Yeah, yeah. He hits the ball and he's watching it like Babe Ruth, and then he flies around the bases. I mean, yeah. to me, when a guy hits a home run, I like that part. And I don't think – I, I think it looks so awesome for a guy like Bryce Harper. Left-handers look better than right-handers anyway. He hits it, and he can watch it, and but he's not showing nobody up. Right. And then he runs around the bases. I think he does it the right way. Mike Trout probably does it the old school way, you know, is what Absolutely. we call it. But, you know, Tatis is a fantastic ball player, Guerrero, all these guys. It's it, those guys, when they hit a home run off of you, they're special players. If they look at it a little bit, it's okay, but everybody's doing it. Yeah. You know, the bat flip, everybody's doing it. It almost is like I, my, me, me, you know. Um, I'd like to see the hit and runs of sold in bases. Can you imagine oh. St. Louis Cardinals of the old playing in baseball oh, today? So great. We wouldn't know how to defend that. Yeah, yeah, it's the truth. It's the truth. It's funny though. You mentioned the bat flips and everything. We had Sarge uh, on a couple of weeks ago, and I, I gave him. I said, Sarge, I was back looking at some of your videos. I think maybe you started all of this. <laughs> <laughs> he wasn't afraid to admire a shot or two. No, uh, <laughs> and that's okay for guys that 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 wear that type of. You know, yeah. I, I, I. He was I longer than life back then. People. Yeah, I remember facing Pete Rose throwing a ball right down the middle three straight times, and I'm two and one. I'm looking at the up and. And I remember, hey, <laughs> he deserves that. So I'm gonna I'm gonna go at him again. Uh, but Sarge was one of my favorite teammates. Sarge was such a great teammate. He's so nice now and everything. Sarge <laughs> was a mean player on the field, boy. Let me tell you, he, yes, told, he, he always had that philosophy: take no prisoners. Let's go get them. I loved it. I like he was one of my favorite players growing up, and I've told him he, that I a thousand Sarge. times. And 
he was he was awesome to watch and it was such a big part of the the Phillies uh in 83 um all right before I let you go because we are we're we're up against it and I know what I want to keep you too too long but uh this has been so enjoyable but your story is is so important for so many people and you know you you leave the Phillies you follow Dallas Green he brings you to the Chicago organization and uh that's where not only your baseball career changed but but your life changed at that moment um and you know you've credited I'm sure hundreds of people for having a, a, a part of that, but, but really it was, it was you deciding at that moment that things had to change for yourself. Um, can you, can you just touch on that a little bit before, before we go and the, uh, you know, the important message that you now give uh, anybody who's willing to listen uh, in the organization? Yeah. You know, April 9th of 1983, I went to jail and that was my last drink. I think I went to jail a couple of days before that April 9th of 1983 is when I quit drinking. Um, when I was in rehab, I realized and it really hit me. It was my mother, you know, I, the embarrassment of being in jail. I went to jail, embarrassment of being in jail. Uh, finally, everything hit me. And I realized that that day in a rehab, I remember thinking to myself, when I'm not drinking, I don't want to fight. When I'm not drinking, I, I, I would walk away from a fight. I'd run away from a fight. So wait a minute. How, how did I get in all these fights? I've been sued three times, kicked out of a country. Is this really worth it? Alcohol changes me. It's just a, I, I, the second day I was in rehab, I knew I wasn't going to drink anymore. The third day in rehab, I was I knew. But, you know, the program says you can't think that way. And you got to I remember my counselor said, well, you got to stay. You're, you're not that cured yet. You don't get cured from this. Right. And I said, well, I can promise you I'm not going to drink. Um, the, 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 the fact that when I look at a guy like Dennis Eckersley, the changes that he made in his life and his career took off, I'm scarred and I'm, I'm okay. I'm, I'm, I mean, it's, it's changed my life for the better and it saved my life that moment in, in Cincinnati. But I'm a little scarred and I, and I use this as a motivating thing for my life and others that I'll never know how good I could have been because when I came back from that moment, I lost three or four or five miles an hour off my fastball up to five at times. I was a 93 to 95 mile an hour fastball guy and I'm 88 to 90 at best. And I got to learn to pitch, which wasn't, you know, I, I would throw the ball Murph and I think it's coming out the same way, but the message that I try to give people being an EAP, I do a lot of listening, but on the other side of what you're referring to, I used to do a lot of speaking about drugs and alcohol, and I'm very passionate still on that subject. Uh, in this world today, you don't hear a lot of prevention on that subject. You know, you got opiates and things that came in that I didn't know how to deal with. I never experienced those sort of things. Of course, as an educator, I know how to speak about them, but uh, I think the most important thing that, that I try to tell people is to be a healthy, capable human being is going to make you a, health, a better, healthy, capable athlete. And, and life is good. It's it, life. God gave us uh, the ability to choose, the ability to think, the ability to do it, do a lot of things that we want to do. He gives us this tremendous desire to want life the right way. And yet that's the wrong way. Now, for some people that can drink, that's OK. Mm -hmm. You know, there's people that can social drink. And uh, uh, I think David Montgomery was a genius. And, 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 and the fact that he may not have picked out the right guy, but. He thought that I was the right guy, and he asked me to be the employee assistant uh, professional, and my response to that was, are you nuts? No way. And I think he was a genius in the fact that he was looking for something, for someone that would be close enough to the players, and he's seen my story. He's seen where my life story had taken me, and he thought, what a better guy to try to implement in my system to try to help athletes and David's whole philosophy was if you help one you've done your job yeah he really believed that and uh, that's what convinced me to become an EAP but uh, I wish I didn't have a story <laughs> yeah. I wish I would have uh, and, and yeah. I think that when people get into that part of their life they say I wish I wouldn't that's not a negative that's a reality mm -hmm. but when you accept what you've done and grow from that getting sober is only the first step Letting go and growing is the second step. And that's why some people can't remain sober and some people can't remain clean, as they call it in the, uh, in the opiate and heroin uh, world and methamphetamine world with drugs. That's because you have to let go and grow. You have to understand that, okay, something happened. It's like, you know, baseball players, they climb the mountain, fall down, get back up, climb it again. 
you know, we talk about mental toughness. All mental toughness is, is when you get knocked down, get up and do it again. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And no doubt about it. And, and the game of baseball takes mental toughness for sure, but the game of life certainly does as well. And there's some good life parallels. Life is difficult. Yeah, it can be. It can be at times. And, and the lessons it's that we awesome. learn, and not only the lessons you learn on your own, but the lessons you can learn from others is, is certainly important. You say that uh, you think back and you think, okay, what if, what if, well, I think a lot of folks in uh, baseball and the Phillies organization and in this city uh, are so very thankful that uh, they don't have to say, well, what if Dickie Knowles was never part of this organization? Where would we be then? Because I think the importance of, of you being here and being a part of the Phillies organization is uh, it goes way beyond the baseball field. And, uh, and for, for that, we thank you, Dickie. And we thank you for, for uh, sharing your story because it is so very important. It, it, it sometimes it's difficult for folks to share, um, but for you, uh, you know, you help one person, you've helped way more than one person along the way. And that's, that's got to feel pretty special. Murph, I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you You're very, very welcome, much. Dickie. Appreciate we appreciate you sharing your glove stories with us. Uh, it's been a lot of fun. I knew it would be, and uh, I appreciate you taking a couple minutes to, to spend with us, and I'm sure the folks are going to really enjoy uh, hearing all the stories. Well, thank you very much, and let's get this club we got now going in the second half the way they're going now. It's going to be a lot of fun. It sure w- This could be it. We could be back in the postseason this year. Let's do Fingers it. crossed on that. Dickie Knowles, always great to talk to you. Uh, we'll take a quick time out and be back with uh, more Glove Stories coming up right after this. Glove Stories with Murph is presented by Parks Casino Sportsbook app. New users download an app store or click parkscasino.com slash PA and use the promo code MONEY for first bet risk-free up to $500. Must be 21. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. Hey, Glove Story listeners, join me and the rest of Team Murphy for the 34th annual Bend to the Shore Bike Tour. Ride your bike to the beach and then celebrate at the finish line, all while raising money to help fallen first responders. Just log on to bendtoshore.org. That's Ben, the number two, shore.org, and register to be a part of Team Murphy today. And welcome back to Glove Stories with Murph, brought to you by the Parks Casino Sportsbook app. And we are reliving that magical season of 2008, the World Championship season, and the helm of that club, of course, the great Charlie Manuel, who joins us right now. And Charlie, we're talking about, we're into August already, into 2008. And, uh, well, things are getting kind of interesting for your team. You guys are playing the Cardinals at uh, Bush Stadium, 44,000 plus on hand to watch. And uh, your team was just starting to get on a roll. You were two games out of first place in the National League East on July the 25th, but you ended the month of July winning five of six. And after losing the first game in St. Louis, you came uh, into game two of the series on Sunday night baseball, facing the Cardinals once again, two and a half games in front of the, uh, the Marlins. I wonder, are you scoreboard watching yet? I mean, I know, I mean, uh, fans are for sure, and I'm sure the media is, but how about you guys? Were you watching it? Murph, you know, uh, if you keep up with your team and and the league and things like that, it's almost like nowadays, you know, it gets somewhere in the ballpark. Usually it's on the scoreboard. Mm -hmm. So, you know, yeah, do you watch? Of course you do. Some of the guys, I heard some of the guys say, no, I don't pay attention to it. Yeah, they did. Yeah, (laughs) that's what I figured. I know know we don't always get the straight story from the guys, but uh, (laughs) – You know, things were getting interesting at this point. And, you know, you guys had played so well in 2007 and had tasted the postseason. So a lot of guys on that roster understood what it took to get the job done late in the year. But you had some work to do because you're still looking up. So Brett Myers would get the start for you guys. Todd Wellemeyer was starting for the Cardinals. The Cardinals would score first. Ryan Ludwig doubled to lead off the uh, second inning. Troy Glaus singled to score the run uh, before Myers shut down Molina, Miles, and Wellmeyer. So he got out of that inning. This was a pretty good Cardinals team. Obviously, they had Albert Pujols in the middle of that lineup, but you also had Ludwig, who had a monster year that season, 37 home runs, 113 RBIs. You had Yadier, Skip Schumacher, Troy Glaus. Um, you guys handled Pujols pretty well in that series. I wonder, yeah. as a manager, when you have a, a future Hall of Famer in the center of, of the lineup uh, that you're facing, what's your philosophy? Is it simply do not let this guy beat you? Exactly. Hey, we definitely, uh, if, if when we pitch to him, you know, like we definitely want to pitch careful. 
Mm-hmm. And he, even with the bases loaded, you were like, uh, we understand, you know, like we've got to get ahead and try to uh, get him out. But at the same time, too, uh, hopefully our pitcher could make some kind of big time pitch and uh, with the bases loaded and actually uh, get ahead of him in the count. But if, but but if not, we still be very careful with him. He don't he don't beat us. We don't we don't want him to beat us. If he beats right. us, uh, we goes against what we think. Uh, you're right about Lud- Ludwig. He had a big year that year. And not, not only that, he seemed like he hit us, you know, like uh, yeah. all the time that year, really. I don't know what, I don't, I don't know the batting average, but he definitely hurt us at times. But, yeah. you know, uh, Mer- Myers got, uh, after that, uh, after they scored, you know, Myers got out of the, uh, the jam and pitched the next couple of innings pretty good. And I think the fourth inning or something like that was when he, uh, I think they got to him for another run. And uh, uh, he kind of he kind of settled in, you know, like and actually took us exactly where we wanted to go in the game. Yeah, and you know what? For Brett Myers, that's what he did for you guys. The thing I love about Brett Myers, and, and we got a chance to talk with him on the podcast a couple of weeks ago. He he is such a competitor. He was such a battler, and uh, he you know he may not have had the best stuff in your rotation, but he was a guy that when you put him out on the hill, he was going to give you every ounce of what he had on that particular day. Not only uh, from a pitching standpoint, but defensively fielding his position and hitting as well. Right. Right. Uh, Myers loved to pitch, and uh, he did, and he always wanted to make his turn. And, and and then you like uh, down the road we made a closer out of him. He, he wanted to pitch and he wanted to pitch in the right place. You know, like he wanted to close games, and yep. uh, that was that was a big big plus about him. That he was a competitor and he was a, he was a fighter. Yeah. Let me ask you this, uh, because we talked about pool holes and how as an opposing manager, you did not want to let him beat you. If you had been managing against your lineup. How would you have tried to attack that? Because, I mean, you had three, four, five guys in that lineup uh, on any given day that could could really potentially beat you. How would you have handled your lineup? I would have, uh, if, because of the balance that we had in our lineup, and I, I always thought to myself, you know, like in, even when I was in Cleveland, but uh, in Philly with the speed and, and the combination of guys that we had, and, and you could go down through our lineup, you know, like I figured we were definitely hard to get down through without somebody hurting you. And yeah. I, when I look at Blue, Blue Holes and Ludwig and those guys, they had a real good lineup here. And when the inning starts, we definitely, we, if they hurt us, we want it to be solo. We don't, we, you know, like we yeah. don't, you know, you're like we, we want to, we concentrate on getting that first guy out in the inning out, you know, like up, up, the, the first guy's up, you know, like we definitely want to get him out. And and we don't want to be pitching to those big big hitters like Blue Holes, you know, like and Lud with guys on base. And yeah. that, to me, that's a key. Yeah, and and I'm sure that's exactly what opposing managers were trying to think about. You know, keep guys off base in front of Ryan, keep guys off base in front of Chase, Jason. Um, but that's hard to do when you have three right. or four guys that that are in the lineup doing that kind of thing, right? Right. When you when you look that go down in our lineup and you you can look at the on base percentages or the batting average or whatever and the talent that we had and the speed and the combination of things that we could do and how we could push the game. And uh, and then you say, well, you know, how do we get down through this? And I, I guarantee you uh, the people when they got specials, I would say the three, four, five, six. Uh, they didn't particularly like to go down through that lineup, you know, just going at people. I, you know, like uh, I, I guarantee you, there was guys that they tried to pick their way. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that was the only way, and and it wasn't easy, and that's why you guys ended up where you did. All right. So Brett Myers, as you pointed out, settled in. He kept the game or the team in the game. Most importantly, Utley would homer in the sixth to make it two one, and that's how it would stay until the eighth inning. Top of the eighth inning, Jimmy Rollins pops out to lead off the inning. Jason Worth would single. Utley would ground out for the second out, but then Howard singled. Pat Burrell singled to score uh, a run. Then Shane Victorino hits a home run. Boom, blink of an eye, just like that, 5-2. You're famous for saying a bloop and a blast kind of thing. You know, home runs were so important for you guys. But this was a couple of bloops and a blast. But you, it seems like... Every other day, this team was coming from behind and doing that kind of thing. Yeah, well, you know what? And that's what that's that right there is what I call staying on them. 
and you know, like yeah. staying after them, and uh, and also using using the talent you got, and and it's also when you see a hitter like Victorino or Jimmy Rollins and the type of player that they are, don't take them for granted, but you know because they could hit fifteen to twenty five home runs, and you like and, and they could get the big hit on you, and basically uh, I remember this, I remember this home run that Victorino hit here. He was up in the count. If I'm if I'm not mistaken, I. Uh, uh, I know he swung. He won, He swung on a two-zero pitch, and I'm thinking to myself, you know, like uh, I hope he gets a good ball. To <laughs> he hit. better hit but, it. <laughs> but he, but he hit it foul. Okay. I, in the, I think the next ball, if I, it might have been a three-one count, and he, he and, and he got and he he hit the ball kind of the right field, uh, off the line some, not necessarily direct right center. Uh, yeah, I remember. I can remember it. Yeah. Yeah, he certainly hit some big home runs for you guys over the years. All right, so the normal steady bullpen uh, that you had did have some issues in this game. In the eighth, Chad Durbin allowed a base hit to lead it off, and in came J.C. Romero, who then balked. Uh, He followed by a fielding error and then a hit by pitch. So a run scored to make it 5-3. Ryan Madsen came in, walked the first batter that he faced to load up the bases before getting a double play to end the inning. Dobbs was playing third that night, so Dobbs, to Utley, to Howard, big double play, big defensive um, uh, play for you guys. We talked so much about the offensive players that you had, but your defense was pretty darn good in 2008 as well. Yeah, you know, when you look at our team, I I think our defense, I I think the whole time that I was a manager in Philadelphia, our our defense was kind of underrated. Yes. Uh, Actually, we didn't talk about it enough. Because, and I think because of people look at me was uh, myself as an offensive manager, right. I love three run homer and all that. Of course, I love three run homers, but also I love baseball. <laughs> and you know, like, and, and, and I, I want a good defense. I want a, a great outfield. Uh, Pat Gillick was always him and I, when our conversations would end a lot with, he would tell me, let's make sure that we got our best defense on the field, you know, like at the end of the game. And you know, like, and that made a lot of uh, of, uh, of, of, of of my attention, got my attention a lot. Mm-hmm. And we, I would say something. I always went by the the fact that we get we get to lead, and I at the end of the game, I definitely want my defense on the field. And also, too, I want to keep my defense on the field once we get a lead in a game. Yeah, and, and b- because we were good, we were really tight on our infield. Our third baseman, you know, like sometimes. People would think, well, his third baseman, they, they, he could hit a little bit better, but our third baseman hit hit enough. They hit, yes. they hit enough because they were good fielders. Yeah, exactly right. And you had yeah. the other guys from, you know, you know, Chase Utley was such an anomaly at second base, you know, the way he was able to be an offensive player at second that you could give up a little offense at third to get that yeah. defense. And that's, that's exactly yeah. what you did. You know, you can win a lot of games swinging the bats right. well, but you can right. lose an awful lot of games if you don't have a good defense and you don't have good pitching. <laughs> and you guys had had both, so uh, so that you know, that Murphy, is yeah, yeah. I, you know what? You know what was really great about our teams, and I mean this from the day one that I first uh, took over being a manager in Philadelphia. Our guys love to play defense. I yeah. think I think more now. I probably didn't talk about that enough because we love to play defense and we wanted to play the game right. And that's where the Utleys and the Rollins and them come in. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. I mean, J- you know, Jimmy obviously was a very gifted shortstop uh, from the day he stepped onto onto the big league field. Chase Utley was a guy that whose defense wasn't considered to be top notch, but man, did he ever work at that side of his game and become a very, very good defensive second baseman before it was all said and done. Right. Yeah. You remember when he had trouble throwing. Yeah. And, uh, I never said anything to him about it. And then uh, people would ask me, the media would ask me, I know that. And I would say he'll work it out, you know, like, and I, and, but I knew that he, that he would, uh, that he would figure it out, you know, like, yeah. and I didn't want to make it bigger than it was, yep. you know, like, and he asked me after he got to the place where he started throwing the ball better. And he says, why didn't you tell me? And I said, uh, I knew you'd figure it out. And I meant that. I mean, that's, that's exactly what happened. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. I love that. That's great leadership. <laughs> All right. It, it, it got more difficult. Bottom of the ninth, Brad Lidge is in the game, and Troy Glaus hits a leadoff home run, right like that. Now it's 5-4 Phillies. He got Molina to fly out to deep right for the first out, but then allowed a single, 
a single and a hit by pitch to load up the bases again before striking out the Stavanoa and Joe Mather to end the game and stay perfect on the season. We all remember right. Brad being, you know, having his perfect season, but it was right. not always easy, right? I mean, he had, right. a, he had it, a battle. You know, when you think about it, you know, like he had uh, 48 saves in a row and going down through the season, I can sit here and close my eyes and I can think of a line drive being hit hard with a uh, tying or winning run on second base yep. or something like that or whatever. And uh, I remember we, we got a triple play, even a triple play one day over when we, we was kind of struggling there in that inning. And uh, if you remember that, and yep. also, you know, like, uh, you know, like at, at times he would be in a jam, but you know what? Uh, Brad Ledge to me, he, he had more talent than people talk about. And he was very capable of, of walking the bases and then striking out three guys. Yep. But, and, but, you know, like he, he, but he also, could could get his breaking ball over the plate and it and he his stuff was so good that you know like he he, he definitely uh, had the the talent to you know, like to wiggle his way out of jams and for some reason you know like this year things worked for him yeah there was times when you know like when you think it uh it was gonna be hard for him but you know what he, he weathered the storms and he and, sure did and he had he, he had it made man i mean he did a heck of a job when I think about it, he he didn't have a good year. He had a great year. Yeah, I mean, I mean, he had a great year. But not only that, we needed all that too. You needed almost every single <laughs> one of them when it was all said and done. That's the truth. Exactly. Uh, you know, and it just goes to show you, a closer, no matter how good you are, no matter how good of a season you're having, being perfect is almost impossible <laughs> because baseball you know dumb lucky things happen to right. both sides um but for whatever reason the the dumb luck yeah. happened towards for the phillies yeah. this year right. and uh and he was able to get through it uh, what we didn't know right. at the time was the team was about to lose seven of their next 10 and watch their right. lead evaporate in the nle's drop two games back of first by the middle of august but Right. We'll talk about that at a later date because uh, that was in the future at that point. Right now, you guys were riding high and things were good as we relived that game uh, back against the Cardinals, August 3rd, 2008. Thanks, Charlie. Yeah, thank you. Glove Stories with Murph is presented by Parks Casino Sportsbook app. New users download an app store or click parkscasino.com slash PA and use the promo code MONEY for first bet risk-free up to $500. Must be 21. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. Love Stories with Murph is presented by Parks Casino Sportsbook app and is a production of SBC Media Partners. The engineer for Glove Stories is Chad Evans. Cindy Webster is our marketing and guest relations director, and our executive producer is Roger Haddon. Whether you are watching us on YouTube or downloading the podcast from one of our major podcast providers like Apple, Google, or Spotify, Make sure to hit like and subscribe so that we can let you know when a new episode of Glove Stories is available. We'll release new episodes weekly throughout the 2021 Major League Baseball season.